Well, it's really great to see so many people here and uh, thank uh, uh, Dave and Sherry and uh, Marilyn and Diane for what they did to help organize this, the slideshow and the food, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I know you have to go, Howie, so you wanted to um, make a um, communication to the group about a scholarship in Bob's name. Uh, my name is Howie Fitzgerald. I'm the Director of Development for the College of Liberal Arts here at Cal State Long Beach, and so my job is to oversee all of the fundraising efforts uh, throughout the entire college, uh, of which psychology is included. And uh, Dr. Thayer, uh, obviously, uh, don't need to tell anyone in this room, was pr pretty influential on on countless students. Uh, I'm sure there's a number out there somewhere, but uh, given his tenure at the university, there were many, many people who were touched by his work. And um, soon after we heard of his passing, um, one, one, of the, uh, one, one of those individuals came to um, our office and has established a $50,000 endowed award uh, that will be named after Dr. Thayer that will go to support graduate research um, permanently on our campus. And so this is one nice way to kind of solidify his legacy um, on the campus. In 100 years, there, you know, Dr. Thayer's name will be ringing true on an annual basis on this campus. So uh, that's uh, all I have to say. I thought it was a nice bit of good news for, uh, for the campus. And again, thank you so much for coming here and uh, to everybody for organizing these uh, receptions. It's a, uh, I think it's a nice time for people to get together and uh, kind of remember his time on campus. So, so uh, this is going to be a chance for us to share our memories and our feelings about Bob. Uh, he was important in, in a lot of our lives. Some of you are his students, so many colleagues and, and friends. So I thought I'd start off and, and talk a little bit about my relationship with Bob. Uh, Bob and I started graduate school together in 1960 at the University of Rochester, so that's when we met. And uh, we became friends shortly after that, and then our lives intertwined in a number of ways. He's, he came to my first wedding, and he came to my second wedding, <laughs> and uh, uh, I even remember the gifts that he, he shared at that time. Um, uh, uh, he uh, he uh, finished up his PhD in record time. He finished up. Uh, his PhD in um, personality and social in three years, came to, from Rochester to Cal State Long Beach, uh, <clears throat> found his way here, and then he was, on a, he was on the hiring committee in 1965, and Marty is looking for a job, and Bob was instrumental in getting me here, so that's one of the things I'm always grateful to him for. Um, uh, then in 1970, the new psych building was built. Uh, it, was, uh, it was actually built, being built before, but it was opened in 1970. And it turned out that Bob's office and my office are together in a suite. So we shared that for 44 years, <clears throat> which meant a lot. I mean, every day we'd come in and we'd, you know, um, review what we uh, was happening in our personal lives and then talk about things in the department. So it was a kind of a close relationship that way, but it was also a personal relationship. We both, after a while, lived in Seal Beach, and uh, for the last 15 years, my house and Bob's house shared a fence. So, and we could always see the light in there, and he would always hear the light there, and we'd call up, and Margo would talk to Bob. And, okay. So, so uh, that was, uh, it's sad not to have him there. Okay, I would, uh, so I wanted to tell a story that's uh, kind of apocryphal, but it's mostly true. Okay, so it's gonna be, <laughs> so this is a story. Um, in 1962, Bob and I were in graduate school, and he just got a letter from the uh, <coughs> Department of Defense that they wanted to draft him. Uh, this was the start of the Vietnam War, and Bob had been in the Army, and so he was in the reserves, and technically he was due to, get drafted, and he was terribly depressed about that. And uh, we sat out, it was in the spring, so it was warm enough in Rochester. We sat on the lawn, we lay down in the ground, we looked up at the stars, and we were chatting, and, uh, and we were sort of going off into this Carl Sagan type mindset. You know, here we are, uh, a small planet in a small galaxy with billions and billions of stars. How important is this in your life anyhow? 
Okay, so we sort of get into that thing. And so the apocryphal part, as I said to Bob, I said, Bob, you shouldn't think about this as doom in your life. And Bob says, yes, I don't have to think about it as doom. I can reverse that, and doom can become mood. No. <laughs> Just reverse it. <laughs> so as many of you know that Bob is uh, uh, one of the foremost scholars in the area of mood, internationally recognized. You know, his book is, was translated not only uh, in, in, in English by Oxford, but there's at least three or four translations into Spanish, into I think uh, Russian, into um, uh, Japanese, into Korean, into Hebrew. Very interesting that he became an internationally known scholar. Um, and uh, one of the things that he was proudest of, I'm not going to say too much more, but one of the things that he was proudest of was uh, that um, his book was selected, uh, The Psychology of Everyday Mood was selected as one of the 50 most important publications of the 20th century. And uh, it was citation classic, but along with, you know, then you start looking at the book, who's in the book? You know, Freud, Skinner, Isink, uh, Maslow, Rogers, and Bob Thayer. I think that was just fantastic. Uh, I'm Jim Linden. I don't know most of you. I know a few of you. I, I came to Cal State Long Beach in 1968. Marty Fiebert was on the hiring committee. So <laughs> <laughs> So I owe a lot of my professional career to Marty and Jack Nygaard, who's the other person. Uh, I met Bob very quickly, very soon after we got, I got here. And back in those days, we were both bachelors. And um, I'll tell you one funny story. We were very close back then. We, we bonded a lot. Um, most of our colleagues, Marty and Carl back then, and and Dale soon after uh, were married and had families and so Bob and I had a lot in common because we were single and we're leading a single life so we were in Hawaii over New Year's early 70s and <laughs> we decided we would write a book on how to meet women <laughs> actually how to pick up women but I don't want to say nothing <laughs> of your daughter the the funny part of it was that neither one of us had a date for New Year's Eve so we, <laughs> we weren't exactly experts at the time but we thought we would maybe give some advice we had a lot of laughs Bob had a you all you all knew Bob had a, a great great sense of humor he would just you could look at him he had this contagious smile and um, uh, he was a very intense person and on the plus side uh, was his energy was, was wonderful. And he shared it with me and with lots of other people, um, Marty especially, of all the people, and of course, uh, his daughter and, and, and family. But uh, I think all of us were very, very lucky, very lucky to have had Bob in our lives. And, and I'm so glad that, that Marty put this together today and with, other, with help from others. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I guess just to keep the chain going, Jim Linden was on my hiring <laughs> committee when I, when I came here in, in uh, 78. And um, I'm also a Rochester guy, like uh, Bob and Marty. And um, one, you know, he was very helpful, and um, not just to me, but a very collegial and um, helpful guy in um, getting through you know, the promotional process in school. and. Um, you know, he modeled a, a, a dedication to scholarship and um, being a researcher and um, an academic that, I, that was very impressive um, from the time that you met him. And that was kind of a constant. Whatever else was going on in his life, that was kind of his load star. You know, that was the most important thing, it seems to me, uh, professionally. And, um, you know, for a guy that was so... Um, in, in some ways rebellious, you know, and, and, and um, he, you know, he, he would oppose anything that he thought was kind of unfair and unjust and so on. He was also an incredibly loyal guy uh, to not only his discipline but to people whom he respected as um, kind of earnest and hardworking um, scholars and academics and so on, like Vince Nolas from, right. from uh, you know, t throughout his life. And uh, it, it was just... Vic Benassi, he supported Vic Benassi. and uh, just... Barry Singer. Barry. <laughs> well, yes, you know, so some of his dedication to scholarship sometimes would lapse in judgment um, <laughs> on the personal end, I get that. 
But um, I, I, I was just struck, and, and I think that he influenced a lot of folks, um, uh, students and colleagues and so on, especially younger colleagues, with, um, with the earnestness, right, of his dedication uh, to his work and the, and the kind of people that he respected and modeled himself after and such. Um, uh, tremendous amount of integrity uh, to his work uh, in that regard. And I don't want to take any more time yeah. with that, but just um, that he was a very commendable person in a lot of ways. Well, I was just reminded I was on Roberto's hiring committee. <laughs> I started wondering, anybody here was on mine? I, I, I have no idea. I just got a phone call uh, living with uh, some friends of ours in New York City at the time, having had no offers up to that point. Uh, but I never did ask Bob whether he was involved in that or not. Nevertheless, uh, well, Bob and I go back a long way, and my original memory of Bob, I guess, uh, stemmed from the fact that when I came here, the model of academic life, I suppose, that I carried around at the time, whether it was valid or not, was that people just spent a few years at some university and they moved on. And uh, shortly after we arrived, Bob invited Betty and me over for dinner, and some point along the way, uh, I asked him how long he had been here. And I still remember sort of the shock of him telling me he had been here eight years, or he just completed eight years here. And, <laughs> what have I gotten myself into? I, mean, I suddenly felt very trapped, like somehow I didn't have some place where, heaven forbid, I would have to stay here that long, perhaps. <laughs> Well, to be sure, I thought about this very occasion many times over the years, and uh, including one which probably came up at my most, my most recent contact with Bob, which now was a while back, but I, I reminded him of this, uh, and of course, many of you know that I just finished my last year here at the university in the spring, and uh, so 43 years later, <laughs> uh, I'm still here, and so is Bob. I just never imagined that either one of us would uh, endure that long, but uh, it's hard to really sort of synthesize and summarize all the memories, I guess, that I've had of Bob over that time, but uh, I guess, like many have said already, you know, that early period was very different than what many of the more recent arrivals probably would understand. And there was a lot more bonding in various ways, including, of course, sometimes under the influence, you might say. <laughs> uh, so I was just recalling a theory uh, which <laughs> remained unpublished, even though at the time, I think Bob and I really were quite serious uh, that somehow we had had some phenomenal insight into human behavior. <laughs> Uh, and it was one of those occasions uh, where Bob, of course, you know, he, he was a regular user, let's put it that way. Uh, and, uh, nevertheless, I still remember sitting on our couch and looking up at the ceiling, uh, and suddenly we just, this theory just came out, and that was what we ultimately called the theory of everything. Uh, and essentially it went as follows. We thought it was a real insight to conclude that basically people do as they damn please. And that's all you really needed to know to understand human behavior, right? I mean, it predicted everything. Somebody did something, ergo, pop the hot. They were doing what they pleased, right? Uh, well, nevertheless, uh, we did joke about this on more than one occasion afterwards. But otherwise, you know, I think I would just echo many of the comments that have been made so far about Bob really being a, a stalwart in the discipline. And, and the other thing I remember about Bob, of course, after he published his now famous study on the benefits of moderate exercise on mood, uh, after that point, which was one, do you remember when that was sometime in the mid 70s? Yeah, it was mid 70s. Mid -70s. Uh, and I've always been a fast walker. Uh, and from that point on, of course, Bob, who felt he had the empirical base, would always chide me every time you saw me walking around campus. Usually, I was coming to or from campus, uh, saying I was walking too fast. It, it wasn't good for your health to do that. And I just would respond, hey, the more the better. I mean, I think you know, I'll, I'll be in an even better mood, more energy, as uh, such. And uh, this continued, really, for quite a while. He, he really did take his work very seriously. And I think he really felt that uh, this was an insight. And, I guess you know the rest is history as far as indeed his contribution in that way to the discipline. But uh, you know, I guess I've also experienced Bob in the twilight, like Ron, and it's hard not to, I guess, think back to 
when we were all younger and sort of remember that as most cherished time in our lives. So. Well, kind of echoing what Jim was saying and Dale, I'm Betty Jorgensen, Dale's wife, um, that when we moved to Long Beach in 72, Bob and Carolyn uh, were the first people to invite us, oh, first people I met in Long Beach, the very first people in Long Beach that we met. And we laughed so much that night that it bonded us kind of forever. And it was just a wonderful experience. And um, uh, Leah and Kara were not born yet, but I remember when they were. And, and in talking to Carolyn now, these days, because Carolyn lives up in uh, Reading, and how those years when we look back on them and how much they meant when we were younger. And, and I, it was just, um, it was a special trait that Bob had in particular to get laughing going. And once it started, it didn't stop. And I have to say that a couple weeks before your dad died, he had called me um, for some information. And I <coughs> called him back and we talked for about 20 minutes, half an hour maybe. And we ended up laughing again about something and just carrying on and it was so fun you know, to it kind of a, take you to a different place, especially at a time when maybe life is harder and how much we need to be able to laugh when life is harder. So I'll always remember that. Um, I think every time we got together, we'd start in on something. And, uh, and at Ken Green's off, um, department parties, it would be the same thing, and, you know, yeah. and that was, and because uh, everyone else knows about his series, you know, the series knows and he's intense and he writes a lot and he knows a lot, but we didn't talk about that, you know, <laughs> and so it was more kind of that very connectability that was so important. So um, we're going to miss him. I just got a few re prepared remarks. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Dave Whitney. I'm the department chair of psychology at the moment. And I, I, what I have here is uh, some remarks that are going to be shared with Kara and Jeff uh, that Diane Rowe, who is way in the back, has collected from faculty and students and folks that have known Bob that can't be here today. Um, and there's really some touching stories in here. As department chair, I want to uh, read a couple of selections. Uh, from some, actually, some contributions first from some past department chairs with some of the things that they've said uh, about Bob. Um, from John Jung, who was a long time uh, department chair some, some years ago, uh, John says, he, uh, Bob came one year after I came. We were like, many of the other new faculty of the 1960s, young and restless. Some considered us, in fact, young, young Turks or rabble rousers because we often challenged the policies and programs of the old guard. Bob was definitely one of, if not the uh, leader of this gang. As a colleague, Bob was generally affable and gregarious with a good sense of humor, but when he disagreed about departmental procedures, he was a force to be reckoned with. However, Bob wasn't all work and no play. I remember wondering why he chose to live in Torrance that involved such a long commute down to Long Beach. But as a bachelor, Bob wanted to be in the midst of young singles and felt that the location, location, location was the most important uh, <laughs> element. And so accordingly, he chose a singles-oriented apartment complex called the Il Pompeii that had a swimming pool and a central <laughs> courtyard that saw more su sunbathers than swimmers. He had good taste. Uh, <laughs> he quickly traded his Ford sedan for a Volvo P1800, uh, the two-seat sporty model that looked like a Batmobile, except that Robin did not occupy the passenger seat. So during the 1960s, many bachelors in the department often ate dinner on campus or nearby and then returned the offices to their offices to work into the evening. But the camaraderie and bonding that occurred under those circumstances helped to build a faculty that was generally congenial a much unlike many other departments that he had had experience with. And I must say that that culture continues today, so we have Bob in part to thank for that. 
I also want to make a comment from Ken Green, who is uh, the most recent department chair. Uh, and he said, my first contact with Bob was over cars. When I first arrived at CSULB, I was driving a white Volvo 1800, a fairly <laughs> unique little sports car. I was pleased and intrigued when I entered it into the parking lot and to find yet another white 1800 park, uh, uh, parked there. So he said, clearly someone must have really good taste, and he wondered who the owner was. Come to find out, it was in fact Bob. So Bob always marked, was marked by firm opinions that he voiced readily and persistently, but also shared with his signature laugh. And he may, always, may not always have gotten his way, but he never shrank from pursuing a cause he thought was important, be it student evaluations, bike lanes to, on campus, or to campus, or faculty hiring. He was a consistent proponent of research and an unabashed popularizer. His own research is a case in point. His article that became a research classic was aimed at professionals, but his books were aimed at the lay community. Bob was delighted by the research classic, but he received his greatest satisfaction from the attention of the popular press. His aims were achieved, and who could ask for anything more? I also think any professor is really marked by the students that they teach and the impact he has on them. Uh, let me share one comment from a student, and, and this is really, this booklet is filled with them. From a current student, Rose Vandersting, not only, thanks Rose. <laughs> Not only was he my beloved teacher for three semesters, but he allowed me to work for him as a TA and to get experience. He gave me excellent feedback on my presentations so I could become a better teacher. He was one of the kindest, most mildest mannered men I ever knew. Although the funny part is, he was quite picky when it came to papers and projects. <laughs> he retained high academic standards. Very, very sorry to have lost him. He told me once how he always told students to keep in touch, but they seldom do. I wanted to be one of those who would write him a, a few years from now sharing what I have achieved. So thank you, Rose. <laughs> Two comments. One is, as uh, this is only my year and a half mark, I guess so, uh, for me being department chair. And some things are very easy and some things are very difficult. And one of the more difficult things that I had to do was considering how to prompt Bob to retire, because we all knew he was never going to retire. But I was getting a couple of phone calls from some of our, our, uh, some of our faculty that, that knew him well, some of our emeriti in particular, that said, you know, it's unlikely that Bob's gonna be coming back to teach, but yet Bob did not want to declare that he, wasn't, that he was going to retire. That was something he really didn't want to do. So as of uh, June of this past year, Bob still wasn't sure if he was going to come back and teach this fall. So July came and I, I said, Bob, you have to tell me <laughs> whether you're going to retire or not. And August came and, and, and we finally, it was time for that decision. So I got Marty because I knew he would have an influence and I got Dale as somebody who had recently retired to say, it's really not that hard a process to retire. <laughs> and so the two of them together along with Ralph Hupka uh, were involved in, in kind of talking to Bob, um, but I, I think our office manager, Sherry Hale, kind of came to save the day and found that he could have one more semester in which he could use his sick leave and not retire. So that was the, that was the plan, that was done, and, and Bob never did retire from Cal State Long Beach, so he'll <laughs> forever be a 49er. <laughs> uh, and then just one, one thing for uh, reflecting back on my personal stories with with Bob, uh, when I first came to Cal State Long Beach, you know, like others on the job market, I, I was considering several places, and as an industrial organizational psychologist, some of us go to business school, some of us go to psychology programs, but I definitely wanted a psychology program. And the reason I wanted a psychology program is, you don't have to wear a tie in psychology. In business, you have to wear one every day. Look around the room, there's only two people with ties, and the other one's a provost. <laughs> um, so Bob was one of the psychologists who actually wore a tie, though. He always wore a tie. So one day I was down in the courtyard between classes, and, and, and Bob said, Dave, come over here. Said, okay. Hey, Bob. How you doing? He said, Dave, 
if you want to be taken seriously around here, you got to wear a tie. <laughs> so I said, okay, thanks, Bob. We'll take that under consideration. Never wear a tie. Today, this one's for Bob. My name's Carl Danson. I uh, served with Bob for about 35 years. The psychology department changed in both physically and in uh, uh, kind of uh, social ways uh, very significantly. Bob was uh, on the faculty and one of the young Turks uh, prior to uh, us moving into the new psychology building. We, um, one of the wonderful things about not being in the psychology building was that People lived uh, in offices with uh, pairs of people, and so a lot of faculty got to know each other in very substantial kinds of ways. Uh, Marty uh, alluded to that earlier. Uh, he shared an office with Bob for many, many decades once we moved into the uh, new building, but people in the past shared offices, and office mates were very important part of the socialization within the department. And, um, and we were scattered all over the place. Um, but we had a sense of being young people who were on the make in a very productive, positive kind of way. And Bob was uh, surely, I mean, to have spent 50 years at, at this university and to have um, produced the work that he did in uh, less than really supportive conditions a lot of the time, uh, I think is really uh, something of, uh, of great merit and um, it's really an honor to honor uh, or to memorialize uh, him here and to have so many uh, people who were there earlier with Bob uh, to be here today. And, uh, and it's really um, especially uh, true to have family members come, and I think it's a wonderful part for the university to be so open-handed with respect to family as well as uh, colleagues. And, uh, uh, and he was a man worth coming today and thinking about for some time. As people know about me, I'm very much committed to my tennis game. It's a <laughs> part, part of my life. I never got Bob to play tennis. It was one of the, you know, the things that I re uh, wasn't able to quite do. But he did have his own sport identity. When Bob was in um, high school, he was on the football team. When he was in college, he was on the swimming team earned his ladder in swimming. When he came out to California, he, he used to play vo beach volleyball for a while. He, for, um, for six months or a year, he took a karate class. So those were the kind of sports activities that Bob engaged in. But the one that he loved the most, and it's an indoor sport, was poker. He was very committed to his poker games. He would go pretty regularly, and he was a winner. I mean, uh, Cara tells me on the tax forms that uh, we're seeing <laughs> winning. Yes, declare winning sometimes because he won so much, yes. Yes, and, but he, he didn't just see it as a game. For him, it was psychology. He was putting into practice all he learned about mood, looking for people's tells, and being able to kind of use his psychological knowledge to- Three um, faces. And read faces, read, yeah, all of the Yeah, okay, great. So I wanted to share that, put that on the record. Um, anybody else want to share some of these thoughts? Uh, along that line, I'm just going to add another. Thing yeah. Where I just had a bottle. We were yeah. talking about those yeah. things, and that is that uh, Bob, being a swimmer, of yeah. course, was also a fairly avid body surfer. And right. At some point, That's true. After he arrived, he tried to introduce me to this, and we were going to Seal Beach and Huntington Beach, and that was all fine. Well, one day, he said, well, let's ride our bikes down to the wedge in Newport Beach. For those of you who don't know that, that's the classic, ultimate uh, body surfing place. Uh, just the waves come. Anyway, so we did after a couple of head plans, and that's it. My body surfing career is over. Um, <laughs> but 
to this day, because I'm a fairly avid cyclist and often ride down the beach trail up Santa Ana and in that direction, coming back in the afternoon into the wind, I think of Bob almost every time because, of course, we were coming back later after the onshore wind was blowing right, right. after, what, two or three hours in the water down there in Newport, riding our bikes against the wind, you know, I pulled on PCH there. Right. <laughs> Left a real indelible memory on my mind. And to this it's day, pretty it's pretty very rare. I don't, really talk, I don't recall which was pretty much it. Well, no, I did continue a little bit, but Good. enough head plants. Kind of convinced me that he kept doing it. I'm Cara Jones, and I am one of Bob's two children. And so I want to thank everybody on behalf of my sister and myself for being here. My sister lives in, in Myanmar and Burma, and so. She was not able at this juncture to, to come, but her plan hopefully is to come this summer um, to, to kind of visit everybody and stuff. So it um, cracks me up because, you know, you see things as a kid in a different, you know, <laughs> perspective, right? And so, but definitely I agree with everything that people have said. I remember, uh, like these books, I remember he would, he would actually allow us to edit my sister and myself, which was pretty nice. And, and I actually caught a couple of grammatical errors. I remember that. <laughs> and so he was kind of aghast at his publisher. He's like, wait a second, you know, my 10-year-old caught you know, some of these errors. So he would send it back. And then anyway, so that was kind of cool. And, and definitely, I think I was a pretty, um, well, still kind of am if you ask my husband. You know, I was, I, I think I probably contributed to the whole idea of the calm energy because I was not calm at all. And so, you know, I think kind of, kind of him, him, you know, really it's okay to walk. You know, I remember walking a ton growing up and everything. And, I, and I, I grew up kind of around, you know, the university in so many ways. I mean, I remember we would go to like the games and we'd come here a lot in the summer and like I was sharing, you know, went to 49er camp and a lot of that stuff. So, you know, and then actually I kind of exist partly because of the university in a sense, because mm -hmm. this is where my parents met. So, and they were playing volleyball, I think, right Marty or something? I think so. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so that was kind of fortuitous on my account. And so, <laughs> And, and, you know, I remember like Betty and Dale and everybody, you know, from when I was really little. But um, so, so definitely, you know, a lot of stuff. He was very purpose driven, very, I mean, you know, our whole lives, so much of it was around research and around, you know, and, and he had these theories that he would try to test out on us and that kind of stuff. Like I remember I was freaked out of balloons. I was scared to death of balloons. Still kind of am, but anyway, weird. So his theory was, of course, right, you, you, take the bad and you try to combat it with the good, right? So his theory was to pick like the perfect dessert and then he'd start popping balloons closer to me as I was eating this perfect dessert. Yeah. He never got around to that because I flat refused. But anyway, that was his theory. <laughs> Probably could have worked, but anyway. And then I remember too, like there were two things that two, well, anybody that ever went into his house would realize that he, he, he enjoyed the same things for many, many years. And so, you know, many, he, he didn't, he didn't uh, interior decorate, you know, too frequently. So anyway, uh, but, but uh, growing up, there were two bumper stickers, which actually were on the walls, his walls. And, and they kind of, I think, capture in a sense who, you know, who he was and what people were saying. So one is, are we having fun yet? Question mark, right? <laughs> And then the other one said, question authority. So, you know, that was definitely right. a huge part of who it was. And I remember when I was little going, well, are you supposed to question authority as to whether you're having fun yet? You know? <laughs> and he's like, no, no, they're not. They're totally separate. And I'm like, and he's like, the whole point, you know, of course, you're supposed to question who authority is. And, and definitely that has, you know, behooved my sister and myself through, through the years. Um, I mean, too. And... And both of us, you know, neither of us are college professors or anything like that. But I mean, definitely, you know, um, a love of academics, and we've gone into graduate school, and, and you know, certainly not afraid to to engage in thoughtful processes and to question truth and what is truth and what is right, and and you know all that. And and um, so I have girls. We have girls, and then uh, my sister has boys, and well, we have one boy as well. But. Um, in any event, Sebastian and Raphael are my sister's boys, and they would love to come down and visit, you know, Uncle Bob and 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 all. That. And even on in uh, January when all, we were down here, and like I remember, so we're on the beach, right? And Raphael and Sebastian, of course, he, you know, Bob can't move at that point, right? <laughs> too too well, and so he's yeah. walking a little bit, and but he still kind of wanted to go like this, you know, so he could have like a picture of you know everybody kind of trying to surf and everything like that, and and so that was that was pretty funny. Um, 
they definitely the boys enjoyed, you know, Uncle Bob for sure. And then, um, and he was very much into like the Save the Whales, and you know, I have pictures of me and my little Save the Whales shirt, you know, and everything growing up. And the Seal Beach, he loved Seal Beach too. I mean, he loved the pier. I remember he came to pick us up from school on the day of the Seal Beach Pier. And there was a huge storm when I was growing up. I think it was Beach, 1982, something like that. It was, and I thought something horrible had happened because he was like in tears, yeah. you know. And in his, it was horrible, you know, for him. And, but the pier had had kind of crashed down, and so he. I don't know exactly. I just remember that as as a, I was little at the time. But I remember that as a huge piece of, of something. And so somehow he really tried to work to you know help. And so um, and very involved in animal, and we we spent a ton of time like at the zoo and that kind of stuff. So very cause driven, very purpose driven, very. Um, I think it's apropos that he kind of interesting and unique, but apropos that he never retired, so he really always Bill B, you know, a 49er, and I think that was just not, it was so much a part of who he was that I don't even think it was a possibility for him to retire. I mean, I think it's almost like you can't retire part of who you are, you know, so so I think for him it was it was kind of apropos and, you know, finished. that he finished out as a 49er, and I think he'd be very, very grateful that everybody was here and to share all the laughs and everything like that, and I think you know, everybody kind of coalesces in the yeah. whole idea of, you know, are we having fun yet? <laughs> and question authority. <laughs>